When Rockfish Games released the full version of Everspace in 2017, it fit into a unique spot in the market. It was a game that excelled at supplying that one-of-a-kind pioneering experience of diving into a fresh run of a space sim like Freelancer or Wing Commander. But instead of only getting that once, you got to relive it every single time you died and had to restart your entire adventure. While well, it did offer something unique in the roguelike gameplay and even justified the design with its clone-based story, the sequel has completely removed that distinction. Yet this redirection of the series is much more of a blessing than a loss because the follow-up that we received is as rich and as meaty as any of the big-name space sims of the past. Everspace 2 starts you in the role of Adam Roslin, one of the very same clones you embodied from the previous game except now you're one of, if not the very last of this batch. The cloning program from a war that has long simmered into a tenuous armistice is over and those that created you aren't keen on your continued existence. So your initial role is a mild one where you're working for the faceless corporation of GNB as a glorified security guard, at least until you're captured in a chaotic attack by a militant gang. Without diving too deep into the realm of spoilers, it's safe to say this sudden kicking of your ass sends you on the run and into the uncertain safety of a hidden base that becomes your new home. From here, your journey opens up into the rest of this massive galaxy brimming with seven stars, or really six since one currently isn't accessible. But even with only half a dozen systems to visit, this world manages to feel large enough to get lost in for hours at a time. With this significant increase in playable space relative to the original Everspace, it comes with a new collection of ways to get your ass around within it. You'll still have the standard limited boost you can use to get into kill positions or out of death positions as well as roam around the numerous derelict ships and stations a little quicker. However, now you also have a cruise drive that lets you mash the accelerator to full throttle to get across each zone as fast as possible at the cost of almost all handling. And then to travel the light seconds and minutes between planets, you can manifest some rectangles and achieve super light speed. In this fastest of travels, you'll still be able to control your ship, but it's really all about making your way around the systems to each point of interest. But points of interest aren't always defined on the map. You can stumble across random ones on your voyage and take little detours whenever you'd like to aid in distress calls, ravage an enemy base, or just obliterate some people that tried to trap you. These small in-between zones are, in themselves, probably as big or bigger than any of the waypoints you reach in the original Everspace. The primary map locations like planets, moons, orbital and ground stations, asteroid belts, nebulas, space junkyards, and various other wild environments can be even larger and feature numerous hidden treasures, enemies, allies, and diverse collections of gameplay. The design of this variety of locations is one of the most impressive parts of the game for me. While there are plenty of twists on floating asteroids and fairly barren planets and moons, the game is littered with visually astounding environments of every type imaginable. The allure of colorful nebula is joined in its gaseous structure by space stations floating on almost whimsical clouds. Skies can be filled with planetary rings while the ground is littered with deep twisting cave and tunnel structures. In fact, despite being a game set in the expanse of space, quite a bit of your time is spent navigating the interiors of these caves along with bases, derelict ship hulks, and somewhat claustrophobic environments. In addition to having their own unique designs, they offer an explicit shift between the approach and tactics you use when not in such a confined space. It sort of shifts the experience from freelancer to descent, and I found that pretty interesting. Yet that tactical distinction is only one small piece of the massive number of mechanics and challenges you'll explore in Everspace 2. Despite only currently consisting of six systems, Everspace 2 ends up feeling far more expansive because of the broad spectrum of gameplay that exists in its densely packed universe. Early on, someone described the game to me as Space Diablo, and as I made progress, this started feeling more and more like the best description. Not only because of the numerous branching and interconnected mission types, nor the random dungeon-like feel of many of the game areas. With the inclusion of the familiar RPG-styled common, uncommon, rare, superior, and legendary system for the various weapons and ship modifications, it definitely captures that Diablo feel. But it also uses fighting, looting, and upgrading your ship to make it feel more like building a character than simply being a vessel you occupy. And like any good RPG, there's not just one character. The game provides several different classes of ships and tiers for each of those classes that provide more robust versions with increased stats and functionality. 
Each ship specializes in unique ways to vaporize your enemies by, for instance, being better at hitting hard up close or having twice as many guns that use your weapon energy twice as fast. They also have exclusive ultimate abilities that charge over time and allow you to unleash your fury on nearby enemies with powers like amped up drones or a deadly automated turret. These ship classes don't limit how you play though, they're more of a guideline that you can shape to your will with the overwhelming number of weapon and item types. You can build out a stat sheet that favors heavy damage, long range sniping, high mobility, tanking shots up close, or anything in between by picking out boosters, shields, armor plating, and energy cores with different strengths. Or you can be like me and get everything as balanced and generic as possible so you can trade any potential strengths for the false comfort of not having any weaknesses. However, even as you're suffocated with loot jettisoned out of nearly every enemy you destroy and box you find, with its variety of levels and rarities, you still may not find exactly what you need. That's where the crafting option comes in. Crafting allows you to salvage any materials you don't need into component parts that you can reform into the goodies you've always desired. In fact, you'll have to salvage three items of each type just to be able to unlock the blueprint to build one, and you'll have to do that for each rarity all the way up. The crafting system for weapons, modules, and consumables like repair kits and shield bubbles is relatively simple, but it's not the only thing you'll be crafting. As you meet new characters throughout the game, you'll be able to fulfill their request to bolster your capabilities with a perk system. These usually require the highest number of materials from every corner of the universe and in numbers that will never let you rest in the struggle to unlock them all. Obtaining crafting and perk materials isn't just a product of breaking down parts though. A considerable amount of what you need is gained from numerous other activities. For instance, you'll be able to mine eight different materials spread across the galaxy, not including their rarer pure variants. This typically entails zapping them off asteroids and rewarding few seconds of rampant physical destruction. However, there are also other mining interactions you'll come across, like dashing around an asteroid rigged with explosives to set them all to trigger within a time limit. Or these even more complex moments where you'll have to turn on a powerful mining beam and sometimes reflect it into a hardened patch of ore. These bespoke interactions aren't just relegated to mining though, they're spread all over the game in numerous formats that make it hard to get burnt out by the game's dozens of hours of content. There's actually a very good chance I spent more time solving puzzles and unlocking crates than I did in combat. Each of these activities use a lot of the same building blocks like finding generator batteries, breaking shield projectors, racing dissipated energy orbs across the map, and finding ultra tiny ass near invisible button triggers to shoot, yet they're implemented and twisted in such a way that nearly no two look alike. The further you go into the vaguely linear progression of unlocked systems, the more complex these become, to the point where they have you booking your ass across entire regions just to open a crate for some handful of gear you might just be tossing into the salvage bucket as soon as you pick it up. Everspace 2 takes players back to a classic genre that normally doesn't see a great deal of gameplay innovation. Fans of space sims still cite games like Freelancer and Wing Commander Privateer as the pinnacle of the genre. Some games have attempted to become the flag bearer of this style of game in more recent years, and games like EVE Online, Elite Dangerous, and even Star Citizen have moved the experience online with varying levels of success. Yet few games have tried and successfully captured the true nature of those classics the way Everspace 2 has and it managed to do so while expanding the interactivity in entertaining ways with puzzles and mechanics that push you into problem solving just as often as testing your reflexes in combat. It's not perfect though. Even with the variety you can enjoy between different ships, abilities, weapons, modules, and consumables, the combat can get a little old. Mostly because of the fact that even though there's a moderate array of enemies, the extremely chaotic nature of late game combat makes it hard to tell. It's easy to lose track of enemies, obstacles, and even your own ship, and this was in third person. Any of my attempts at playing from first person felt like trying to fight Muhammad Ali with a fireworks grand finale blasting my eyeballs. I found myself most of the time going into battle ready to face roll over my abilities while continuously firing at whatever was closest until I could clear enough bad guys to see what was going on. And if I kept track of my three health bars, consumables, and weapon energies in the process, I was usually successful, except when I wasn't. I couldn't help but make comparisons to Chorus, a game that had its issues but few that involved combat. The dynamic nature and fun of high maneuverability was built into the game and your weapon choice was more of a requirement than a convenience. Sometimes I would also run into issues with puzzles as well, especially with how difficult it could be to find the necessary triggers for the solution. 
Even within the main missions, there would be frustrating moments where I'd just be fumbling around looking for some minuscule out of the way spot or a button nowhere near the objective I needed to activate. The toughest ones could be extremely counterintuitive, but if I did discover the solution, it felt more like pure luck than a natural resolution. Thankfully, nearly all of those were optional and skipping them didn't make me feel all that bad. One place I did assume Everspace 2 would move forward from the original was the use of these motion comic or animatic cutscenes. They're not terrible, but they do very little to help a story that isn't exactly thrilling for the majority of the game. It's hard enough to sell a story where the objective is always, go get an item from that guy, and that guy always tells you, I just gave it to this other dude, on a loop for 40 hours. But when the core story beats are fed to you in a glorified PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't give you much to look forward to. These issues aren't really issues, though. Everspace 2 is a thoroughly enjoyable game with a hearty helping of diverse content both within the campaign and beyond it. It looks great and plays great outside of a couple probably broken zones and obviously made the best use of its more than two years of early access. If you were a fan of old space sims or wanted to dip your toes into the void and carve out an interplanetary life, this is one of the best modern representations of the genre out there. So for those reasons, it's getting the abbreviated score of good. If you'd like to see more hot takes, warm satire, and tepid commentary about video games, make sure to like this video and check out my other abbreviated and unabbreviated reviews.